Matthew Lewis scouts the edge of a Thomasville parade for that perfect shot, seeking images in the crowd, as he did 50 years ago in our nation's capital, long before he even knew he'd become known as one of America's greatest news photographers. His father and his father before him had been photographers. Photographers prove themselves not so much with technology, but with their ability to convert what they see into an arresting image. You have to sense at what precise moment to take the shot and what will happen when you do. Something Matthew learned during his years of shooting events at Morgan State College in Baltimore. You know, I photographed all the football games, all the track meets. I worked so hard, so passionate about photography, that's how I learned. And people took notice, including Gordon Parks, the celebrated staff photographer and writer for Life magazine, who gave the young man with all the promise a few words of advice. He said, you know, lenses, your wide angles, your tall photos, your 50, each one it's like your adjectives and adverbs. Each one will tell a different story, will give a different impact. I said, Gordon, I'm 33, and before I could get another word, he points his finger and smiles. It's never too late. It's never too late. Soon, Matthew was freelancing for the Baltimore Afro-American. I got my 35 millimeter camera, you know, and I'm really going big guns. Anytime any importance happened in Baltimore or even Washington, D.C., I was there. On August 28, 1963, the paper sent him to cover one of the largest political rallies for human rights in U.S. history, the March on Washington. For young Matthew Lewis, it became much more than an assignment. When Dr. King starts that I have a dream speech, I couldn't, I was so galvanized, I couldn't hardly walk. I couldn't, I couldn't hardly take pictures. And so I'm looking, looking. I spot this guy like on a little mound or something. That face is so proud, and then behind him is an American flag. We'll wait until that flag, I think, you know, is in the right position, click. And I kept walking all of a sudden, I spied this lady. You just see the hope, the hope in her face. The hope is there, and just prayer. You see it, and you just react to it. I move on a little further, then all of a sudden I see this a group of guys. There's Burke Lancaster, then next to him is Harry Belafonte, next to him is Brando, next to him is a great producer, John Makowicz, then next to him is a great writer, James Baldwin, next to him, Sidney Poitier. You know, I'm overwhelmed. Later in 1963, the nation and the world was shocked by the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Dr. Carl Murphy said, I want you to cover JFK's funeral. I find my way up to the rotunda. All these flags, all these hundreds of people. There's a young black girl, and she pulls out a handkerchief and up to her face while she's walking. Boom, click, one picture, that's it. When they come out of the Capitol building, I pick the best spot I think I can have. I didn't know how they are going to do it. I've never covered anything like this before. I look, there's a leaf kind of curled up, and the wind's blowing it. Zip, zip. A little leaf, I heard it. I know I took a picture of it. I know I did, I couldn't help myself. But anyhow, I started concentrating on Jackie. I could see she's about to break down and cry. You know, it really, really hurt, touched you, you know. The civil rights issue continued making news into the late 60s and beyond, despite the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964, which banned discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin. Not all hearts were changed, but some were. This was the first day of school in Baltimore, Merwin. Just walking into the building and, and lo and behold, this is the first photograph, first uh, photograph situation I saw. And what more better picture can you come across? Here's an elderly white teacher hugging a young black child about to break down in tears. Pure emotion. That's what photography is, and it could be that powerful. Some of Matthew's shots were just plain sad, evidenced in this 1968 photo of a confrontation between the Capitol Police Chief and demonstrators following the establishment of a camp called Resurrection City on the Mall in D.C. That started in Mississippi, and also they had a mule train come through the South, bring hundreds of 
African Americans to the nation's capital. Bob Maynard and I covered it for 14 days. They had so many thousands and thousands of people and they started having quite a few disturbances. They're holding their hands out and they're pleading not to throw the tear gas canister. And Jerry Wilson is telling them to go back to a Resurrection City. People told me this is a powerful shot. It is, but I, I, I wasn't happy taking it. The impact of one shot, of which Matthew has many, thousands perhaps, each image stored in his treasure trove of a basement in Thomasville, where his wife Janine's family hailed from, a time capsule of sorts. People come down here and they're, they're flabbergasted, you know. Many of the pictures were taken during his days at the Washington Post and the Afro-American. Admiral Zumwalt. This is uh, Hugh Hefner 1972 uh, Bun into the Ear contest. Oh, uh, Manon Turner and Alexis Smith on assignment in uh, New York City. Uh, President Nixon with the Thanksgiving turkey. That's the very distinction between a news photographer and other photographers. We have to focus on just that one image, that one picture that the Washington Post wants. You can't think in terms of two or three. Newspapers only have room for one photograph. That's all they want. You attune yourself to really lose yourself, to focus on getting that image to tell the story as best you know how. Setting, impact, emotion, all wrapped into a single powerful and memorable image. The telephone rang, King's been shot. They sent me to 4th and U because they knew the ride's going to break out. Well, all hell really broke loose. When I raised my camera up, boy, I'm telling you, I had a hard time pressing shut up. You know, I, I took the photograph, but that's, I really hesitated there. But I'm a news photographer, and, you know, I took it. And those are the things that's, that, that's mind-boggling, that, that, you know, that you never, never forget, never forget. You come back to the post, you go to the dark room, make a eight by 10 print. I feel really great when I see that picture come up. They put a little caption sheet on it, who, what, where, and why, and you go to your next assignment. Everything done at the Washington Post is boom, 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 you know. I used to wonder why people like Bob Woodward and Sally Quinn, you'd see each other crossing the newsrooms and they wouldn't say anything. Well, heck, I, I, that's fine with me. I don't need to say anything anyhow, you know. Now I know what that's all about. They're totally focused on what they're doing. You know, synergy, man, you, you could feel it. You know, nobody, nobody had to even talk to you. I'd go to work and uh, they say, go Enterprise. That happened quite a few times. Go Enterprise, go find something. So you're riding and you're looking, you're looking for anything, you know, what's gonna happen? But they want a photograph for the next day's newspaper. I'm driving through Rock Creek Park, and all of a sudden I see these two girls. They're on the swing, and you wait, and you wait until everything's just right. The smiles get better, and the blonde hair is flowing out, and they're at right angle. You go, boom, you're working on the next assignment. And a couple of days later, I start getting this mail at the Washington Post. I mean, dozens of letters on this one photograph. That's what photography is all about to me, and it's been all my life, is that capturing that emotion, that genuine emotion is an emotion of joy, but more important to me, it's a young black girl and a young white girl. Later, Matthew shot photo essays for Potomac, the post-Sunday magazine. One of his more memorable assignments was photographing chicken entrepreneur Frank Perdue in a hen house. And it struck me that he looked like a chicken, so <laughs> I said, uh, would you pick up a chicken and place it on his lap? He, he graciously, yeah, I'll do that, you know, and uh, a lot of people liked it. I liked it too. <laughs> yeah, I like I liked Frank Badu. After so many years of great photography and a Pulitzer Prize, it's not surprising that one Matthew Lewis image sticks in his mind. This is a biggie. I'm at the Washington Post and I go to work one day and this old Reverend King is speaking at Vernon Avenue Baptist Church and we need a photograph. This was six weeks before he was assassinated. When I opened the door as I walk in, my heart skips a beat. And man, the light was shining 
It was like electricity, white lines going vertical this way and that way. And uh, when he started speaking, the light cast went around his mouth and around his eye sockets and up. And when he pointed his arm and it went straight up to his finger and he opened his mouth and boom, you know, that was it. I could give a rat's behind whether the post ever, ever used it or anybody ever used it. This picture I saw in front of me was for Matthew Lewis Jr., you know? Spoken like a true artist, like a man with a heart for his work and his subjects. So what does a retired gentleman do with his time? Sorts through his prints and his memories and picks up the camera from time to time, ever vigilant for that perfect shot. You gotta do it. You can't help yourself. That's been my life, it still is today. You focus on that one photograph. Boom, just like that.